Hey everyone, today I thought we'd look through the offerings of Dead by Daylight and discuss the possible origin and meaning of them, as it's something that doesn't really get talked about all that much. Offerings in general, I feel I neglect a bit. Let's get into it. First off, the way offerings work in the realm appears to be that they are burned in the campfire prior to the start of the trial, which is why when we load into a game, we see them pop up and then literally burn and crackle away, unless the offering is rejected or overlaps with another, in which case, it is not burned. Starting out, let's cover the individual BP category offerings. For the survivors, it appears the category offerings are all different flowers, wrapped with laurel into a sort of bouquet, or in the brown offerings, into a sachet of dried leaves or petals. This suggests first off that there is actually quite a wide variety of flowers in the realm. It possibly suggests also that someone like Claudette could be responsible for the formation of these offerings. In botany knowledge, we learn that she collects plants to create tinctures. It's possible she also taught the others which flowers to collect for the offerings, to please the entity and boost their rewards in certain areas. The primrose blossom represents the altruism category. The primrose likely represents the altruism category due to its association with healing. The primrose is said to have pain-killing properties. It's described in its yellow iteration to open at the very last moment before the sun gives place to the night. Therefore, this small bright flower opening just as darkness strikes could represent and encourage altruism, like a flicker of hope within the darkness, a new golden source of sunlight despite the lack of. The Sweet William represents the boldness category, and I think this is largely due to the visuals of this flower, with its white outer edge but bright inner center. It also has many sharp petals, which are quite striking. Sweet William is also known to attract birds, bees, and butterflies with its nectar, or in our case, killers. Overall, it seems like a good visual for boldness. Apparently it's also quite a short-lived flower, which may also play into the risky nature of acquiring boldness by being in chase with the killer. The bog laurel for the objective category I thought was particularly interesting, as this seems to come specifically from Backwater Swamp. It's said to be a beautiful purple flower that grows in the midst of the tainted swamp. There's only one swamp in the game I can really think of, that being backwater. I couldn't really find a meaning necessarily behind the bog laurel. Potentially it's used to represent objective, as it shows a colourful flower succeeding to live and survive within a bog a dark, muddy place that may otherwise seem unhabitable. Light emits from generators, which are the objective, lighting the darkness of the trials. Like the bog laurel provides the otherwise dark swamp with colour. That's the best I've got for that one. Let me know what you think. Finally, we have the crisp leaf amaranth for the survival category. This one is quite straightforward. The amaranth is known as the unfading flower. This representing survival with the idea of hope never fading. They are further described as immortal and are capable of retaining their bright colour for a long time. So yeah, they represent the persistence of hope in the dreariness of the trials, possibly. All of the killer category offerings are formed of the bones, blood, or guts of different types of birds, and also other materials such as sharp metals, ropes, and branches, into a wreath of some kind. First off, the Tanager wreath for the brutality category is made up of the guts and blood of the Tanager bird, as well as sticks. Possibly this is formed of the Tanager, as they are quite bright birds, some with almost a blood-like colour. Potentially it's almost like a bull seeing red type thing, with the killers using bright birds instead to anger them. The Raven wreath represents the deviousness category. This I presume is the case because ravens are part of the Corvus genus, which is shared with other species, such as crows. Crows have a large tie to the entity, and are seen throughout the trials. And as deviousness represents the use of your power well, many of which are entity given, it makes sense that something that calls upon the entity in regard to deviousness would be made of the entity's bird, or bird type. However, interestingly, unlike the others that include the actual bird as part of the wreath, this wreath instead is said to include blackened branches and coals. It doesn't say it has raven bones in the wreath, suggesting possibly that the killers are fearful of actually using the crows to form the wreath, so they imitate it with blackened branches and coals two dark materials that are similar to the feathers of a raven or a crow. The spotted owl wreath, which represents the hunter category, I presume is simply in reference to owls being nocturnal predators, or hunters to smaller creatures like mice, a similar situation to the trials. Spotted owls sit and wait for their prey before pouncing, or swooping, I guess. So it makes sense why they would invigorate the killer's hunting ability 
It's said to be crafted out of sharp metals, rope, and feathers, presumably the spotted owl's feathers. The shrike wreath for the sacrifice category are carnivorous birds. Their genus name is derived from the Latin word for butcher, and they are even sometimes referred to as butcher birds. The wreath is said to be made from sticks, strings, and bones, the bones presumably taken from the shrikes themselves. This makes sense, a carnivorous bird's bones used to acquire a greater reward for sacrifice. Okay, on to the other BP offer. Offerings. The escape cake isn't actually a cake. Its flavor text says, this picture of a cake sure is real. This is in reference to the Portal games, where you're promised a cake for completing a series of trials, only to be deceived. In universe, we can presume that the entity has simply adopted a similar strategy with its own trials, feeding on the false hope of survivors, possibly striving to escape, with the idea of cake as a reward. So, you know, kinda mean. The hollow shell is described as an unidentifiable cocoon, which was breached by whatever was inside. My initial thought with this was that it was simply meant to represent the killers as shells of their former selves, or hollow within, as this is a killer-only offering. As it's a cocoon, it's likely to be an insect of some kind that used to be inside, possibly something like a moth or maybe a wasp, or more than likely, a spider, which has large visual similarities to that of the entity's claws. I don't feel it's something like a butterfly cocoon, as that doesn't seem all too fitting for the killers. The sealed envelope is a curious add-on. It's said to be an unaddressed and unopened envelope, yellowed by its time. Its message will never be known. The only envelope I ever remember reading about within the lore was within an Arcus entry, where the observer receives an invite to the entity's birthday party. Therefore, possibly this envelope could also be from the entity itself, and maybe remains unopened due to fear of its contents. Because, I mean, why else would they not open this envelope? It seems kinda strange. The survivor pudding seems to be basically what it appears to be, a big pudding made up of the survivors pretty gross. It's described as a heavily salted pudding, possibly in reference to players getting angry when they lose or don't escape. This invigorates the killers to succeed in the trials, by seeing the evidence of their previous victories. The bound envelope is another quite mysterious offering. The envelope is said to be an opened envelope resealed and bound with four coloured ribbons. These four ribbons are presumably coloured based on the different point categories, as this offering gives extra BP to all categories. As it's a survivor offering, we could assume there's the yellow of the primrose, the bright ready pink of the Sweet William, the lighter pink of the Bog Laurel, and then the crimson red of the Crisp Leaf Amaranth. It's possible that this envelope is the aftermath of the sealed envelope being opened, now resealed. Maybe it's even the survivor's response to the entity's letter. <laughs> Who knows? Bloody party streamers are simply some party streamers but covered in blood. This seems to be a bit of a sadistic joke on the entity's part essentially celebrating the spilling of blood in its realm. Yup, I'm pretty sure that's about it for that one. In a similar way, the Ghastly Gateau, Gruesome Gateau, and Sacrifice Cake are all basically the same idea, except with cake, but made of potentially a mix of actual cake and human body parts. We can see eyes, fingers, and guts throughout the three different cakes, and also shards of glass. So, a bit of the cake is for the killers, and a bit for the survivors. Okay, now let's move on from the BP related things. First up, the chalk pouches and salt pouch. Both of these are described as small cotton pouches filled with white chalky powder and black salt crystals respectively. Both chalk and black salt have associations with rituals and ritual or magic circles and having protective qualities from demonic presences. Presumably the chalk and salt within these pouches therefore provides luck because it's almost like a personal protective circle. The black salt statuette has essentially the same reasoning, except this time the salt has been formed into a statuette of a woman kneeling and offering a gift, with the survivors creating statuettes of their supplication and of offering gifts to in return be protected for the upcoming trial. The entity probably doesn't understand their language, so the visual of them pleading on the statuette would do the job. Finally, Vigo's jar of salty lips also plays into the whole salt thing. This is described as a tightly sealed jar containing torn human lips floating in a murky brine. We can presume this is in the survivor's possession after their discovery of Vigo's lab in the realm, something which may look fairly similar to that of the Blights. 
It's quite possible these lips belong to prior survivors, those who were dead and drained in the void. Wherever Vigo is, he potentially used these himself to ward off the entity, again a bit like his own personal chalk circle, except these are stronger so he can maybe ward off the entity somehow. We know he did have magic of some kind, and was one of few people capable of manipulating the realm, which is why they are the strongest form of luck offering for the survivors. The blueprint offerings are quite likely creations of both Ben Benedict Baker and Vigo, one even being directly credited to Vigo with Vigo's blueprint, the other three being the Bloody Blueprint, Torn Blueprint, and Annotated Blueprint. I mention these two names because of the contents of the blueprints, which directly map out the trials themselves and allow influence over how they spawn. The only two people we really know who could both manipulate the trials and also document them really is Vigo and Benedict, aside someone like the Observer I guess. The effects of these offerings are quite interesting. For killers, the basement hooks are revealed at the start of the game, and then survivors are able to choose where to spawn the hatch. Looking at the blueprints themselves, we can actually see the shapes of structures and in-game tiles. As the annotated and Vigo's are the same image, just with different orientations and scales, it's likely that Vigo was also responsible for the annotated print too. Or possibly as these offerings were released in chapter 17, and Felix Richter, an architect, also released with this chapter, it's pretty possible he annotated Vigo's blueprint himself, which would explain the zoomed out and, well, annotated version of Vigo's own blueprint. We know that Felix has a unique insight into the entity and its realm. Also added in chapter 17 was the Blight, so possibly Blight could have created his own blueprints too, the killer related ones. Him also being a somewhat realm breaking scientist. Their bloodied and torn look wouldn't exactly be out of the ordinary for Blight. The coin offerings that dictate the number of chests in the trial don't seem to really mean much, I think they're just meant to simply be a currency used for a currency gained, as it were. Based on the quality of the coin, the number of chests is altered. I think it's really just that simple. It's an action both survivors and killers can take, and the entity understands it by removing or adding chests. The reagents are offerings that allow you to change the thickness of the mist or fog in the trials. The origins of the reagents are unknown, but we can possibly get a vague idea with their flavour text, where both an unknown notebook and Don a sketchbook are referenced, talking about the mist and how it can be used for protection. I think it's probable therefore that the reagents are creations of previous survivors, namely Donna. The reagents may literally chemically react with the trial grounds themselves, within the campfire, producing varying degrees of mist. The oak branches I presume hold power as they are physical parts of the trial grounds that have been taken by the survivors and killers, so when offered allow for a substantial change to the trials with the moving of hooks. Hooks being the only way in which the entity is able to accept the sacrifices of the killers. The mouldy oak depicted as damp and decaying is simply a normal branch from the trials. The rotten oak holds more power due to the strange markings it's said to have, possibly the entity's language. Then the putrid and petrified are both unique one with black putrescent liquid oozing out, and the other petrified, and so more stone than wood. Potentially these hold a higher power due to their greater corruption. The Memento Moris are these charms with chains and skulls on the end. Memento Mori is Latin for remember that you die, a reminder of the inevitability of death. The variations of the Moris in game seem to just purely decide how valuable this offering is, and so how many survivors the entity will allow the killer to kill by their own hand in the upcoming trial. The Cypress Mori is likely made of Cypress wood, likely carved by the killers from the trees of the trial grounds. The Ivory Mori is made of ivory. The only way I believe the killers could have gotten ivory is through the teeth of animals. In the case of a Mori, we can probably assume human and likely the survivors. Again, this charm therefore is presumably carved from a tooth or teeth of some kind. Finally, the ebony mori is probably made of ebony wood, which is often used for ornamental purposes. This wood in particular may hold a darker power from the entity itself possibly. Based on the ebony mori's flavour text, it appears that when a mori is offered, the killer may even directly speak to the entity to make a request to kill, this being the literal thing they offer in return. The shroud offerings are presumably meant to be death shrouds, and so hold power in the realm as a result. Through the descriptions, these are said to allow you to both calm and cool upon the entity, to spawn you in a preferable location as survivor or killer. Shroud of Union has a simple knot, 
Shroud of Separation is a black shroud that is falling apart. Possibly this has belonged to a killer. Finally, Shroud of Binding is the only purple one which has many knots, four to be exact. The knots therefore seem to correspond to a certain thing. Potentially this is the best form of communication between survivors and entity that can be done. Each knot likely represents a survivor, and how many they wish to spawn with. The fact Vigo has a shroud suggests also that he is indeed dead. The quote beneath from Vigo stating, I found marbles through the years in the fog, but only now do I understand how to bend the fog's irrefragable rules. As this is from his journal, this could quite possibly be an acceptance of his death, and so when offered in trials, the survivors are requesting for their own deaths to be avoided, with the killer spawning away from them. Alternately, Vigo could just really be that powerful and capable of using some kind of magic to bend the trial's rules, but the fact it's on a shroud, and again probably a death shroud, kind of puts that into question I feel. Again, unless it's not a death shroud. The wards are offerings that appear to block others. A ward is something that guards or protects, and unlike the other offerings, these appear to be drawn onto the hand and not burnt in the campfire. The black ward has the killers draw a shape that looks almost like an A, and the survivors with the white ward a hexagonal shape. We know that symbols drawn onto the hand hold power with the entity. Lisa's friend Pam drew a symbol on her hand that led to her death, and then Elodie drew a symbol onto her hand too which appeared to result in her being taken into the realm. Lisa, or the hag herself, also scratched a symbol into the mud of the swamp before she was taken. These wards protect the add-ons of the survivors and killers, and from the void itself it seems, based on Black Ward's description. So yeah, quite simple, a symbol of protection that the entity can understand. The sacrificial ward directly states that the user surrenders their will to the entity, denying the choices of any other offering, specifically map-related. The symbol drawn is a fish-like shape almost. A bit like the knots of the shrouds, we can presume that the simple symbols are something that means something to the entity, therefore allowing an exchange to happen within the upcoming trial. Finally, I thought we could look over the retired offerings. The splinters would allow you to play as a killer you didn't own for the next trial. These splinters were representative of a certain killer. They're quite simple and straightforward. Each splinter represented a a killer in a straightforward way. The entity would grant that killer to then be played. I really feel there's not much to this one. The Moon Bouquets, and more specifically the New Moon Bouquet, was an item that lets you alter the lighting within the trials or in-universe, it was stated to call upon the darkest moonlight. This offering has been referenced in a rift charm, and also the rose tonic add-on for the blight, where it is stated to be exceedingly rare. Each bouquet contained roses, and an image of the moon during its cycle, at various points depending on the rarity of the offering. Or potentially this could be a mirror reflecting the moon, possibly even the recent limited pocket mirror items, that we can retrieve from the white glyphs. A bit like those initial BP offerings, we can presume these bouquets act in a similar way, made up of things from the trial grounds, and formed for the entity to then perform an action. Alright, well, that's gonna do it. We will be back for a part two of this, focusing on the map offering specifically. I do hope you enjoyed, and as always, be sure to drop any additions or thoughts you have down below. Thanks, and goodbye.